So hi everyone! For those that might not recognize my voice, my name is Miss Stringer. I am the sculptor and ceramics teacher, sort of in the Vasque area. Today I'm going to be talking to you about the second part of your FAO project, which is the monument proposal, where unlike last year where you had this responsibility to take what you know and turn it into this sculptural monument, you are only this time turning it into this proposal for an actual location in space. So a little bit different and with that you'll be able to explore the beautiful potential of having a location, viewer interaction and sort of what that might look like with your monument as well as just a different way to get your message across from all of your FAO paper research. What I wanted to do specifically with this video was really highlight a couple different examples that we have in sort of the American monument history and sort of show you the different materials or even the possible ways of interaction with the viewer and how how these artists, designers, architects are getting their message across in a very beautiful and impactful way. So I want to begin uh, this sort of short video with one of my personal favorites was a work by Myelin. It's the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. Hopefully you've all have sort of seen and discussed this work in class. However, I hope to highlight a couple different points as well as how viewers were interacting with it in a very impactful and beautiful way that really highlights the symbolism and the knowledge of the sort of American people at the time. So this work was built in 1982. It is constructed out of this really beautiful black granite. It is two acres within the Constitution Gardens, which is in the Washington DC capital or the National Mall. Before I begin showing you the beautiful v uh, Vietnam Veterans Memorial, I wanted to quickly talk about how in the past, a lot of monuments that were to war or other important moments within a history, whether that was European or American, were really focused on several different individuals that symbolically stood for a whole. So you might have a leader, maybe a very beautiful goddess of liberty or justice sort of in the center, and then sort of surrounding individuals that represented this larger life that was lost during that war or that moment. However, this really changed in the 20th century and it became a lot more minimal, as well as how could you highlight everyone that had sacrificed their life for a mission or a goal or a nation. So what do we see here in this image? On the right hand side we see Maya Lin's very, it's like three very simple drawings that she did while she was an undergrad at Yale and these very minimal simple gesture became something that was extremely powerful um, and impactful to the viewer as they went through and experienced this monument. Just visually looking at it, it was a monument that sort of sunk into the earth, then you'd have to travel into it and then sort of outwards. She specifically placed this sort of right angle cut. One side is pointing towards the Washington Monument, the other one is pointing towards the Lincoln Memorial, and so we have a very specific placement between the two memorials that is supposed to, again, signal to the viewer that this is something in history, this is something that was experienced as part of our past, and we have to move through it in our present state. When the viewer walks down, it's not what you would assume where it sort of starts chronologically from the left hand to the right side. It actually starts in the center as the sort of earliest date and time, and then moves to the right and then resets from left to right. So again, thinking about how the viewer is going to interact and spend more time with something than would normally happen. A lot of times people just sort of look at the monument and sort of leave or take a picture and then leave. But as you can see, the viewer themselves is sort of sinking into the earth, arriving at the other side. So what is this black ground? granite. Um, for one thing, it actually had to be American black granite. Uh, it couldn't be Canadian or some other country, just because there had actually been a lot of tension with that. A lot of individuals in America who escaped the draft fled to Canada, and so a lot of um, patriots didn't want to use Canadian stone. It, it really needed to be an American material. And each of these granite um, blocks has been polished to where they're almost a mirror reflection. And the only thing that isn't sort of non-reflective is the etching of each individual name who died during the Vietnam War. What's really fascinating about this is that the names have been placed in chronological order, not in alphabetical order, which is a lot of what other monuments have done in the past. Uh, this was extremely new in the sense that, again, this was a method and a tool 
to make the viewer stay longer in this monument and think about the impact of that loss of life. The full name was included instead of a photograph of that individual because really specifically for Maya Lin, this full name represented the total person from the beginning of their life to the end of their life, while a picture really only symbolizes one moment in time for that person. So again, thinking about these extremely symbolic things, such as a name or the black planet, or just thinking about if it's in chronological order or in alphabetical order, has impact in how the viewer will experience this monument. The last thing and my favorite thing about this monument is the reflectivity of the granite itself, where it becomes this sort of mirror of this other world, again sort of signaling this scar or sort of past that is in the reflection, and we ourselves are sort of witness to that past, but can ultimately move forward in time, memorialize what was lost, but also move forward into the future. And so for Maya Lin, this was a way to have this other world be a symbol of a scar, where ultimately scars are something that lasts and they remind us of what has happened, but ultimately they will eventually heal and move forward into the future for the better that is sort of what Maya Lin intended. And so again, just thinking about how such a simple and powerful minimal gesture becomes something that is just loaded with significance. Um, so quickly, I'm just going to give you some other examples of monuments that are different in how they interact with people, but also in the material that they're using. So Marcus Ramirez Ere, Toy and Horse, is a play on the Trojan horse, and this was a monument that occurred for an entire year down by the Tijuana and San Diego border. Due to the high influx of people that we have going back between two sides, this is a play on the Trojan horse, a ancient Greek myth. And so we all sort of remember, hopefully, that story. What Marcos Ramirez Ire is, did is he sort of built it into the crazy symbolic structure where instead of just a one-headed horse, it actually became a two-headed horse. So it's talking about how both sides consider each other an enemy and yet are so very much dependent on each other to survive. A second work is Cleve Jones and others sort of names project, which is the AIDS memorial quilt. And this is a patchwork quilt, so it's something a lot more material in that it will ultimately degrade as it's made out of fabric and clothing and jewelry. This has been going all the way back since 1985 and has continued and has shown at different times in America's history from 1985 until now. Each of those four squares represents four people that died of HIV AIDS. And again, how do you remember an individual who has lost their lives to something that needs to be remembered throughout American history. And how do viewers engage with this? So this was hugely impactful. It took up the entire lawn of Capitol Hill. Eventually, people were allowed to walk through and examine each and every quilt. It was up for the viewer to interact with, choose which ones they wanted to see, and, and move on. The last work that we're going to look at, Kim a Abelis's Walk a Mile in My Shoes, and this is made of concrete, ceramic, bronze, and tile. And Kim Abelis wanted to really pay homage to her, or Martin Luther King Jr. and his contribution to the civil rights movement and compare it to a lot of the civic leaders that we have today in Los Angeles. So what Kim Abelis did was photograph every individual that participated on the march to Capitol Hill from the south all the way north. Every single person that participated in that march, she photographed their shoes, and each of these shoes can be found along the Martin Luther King Boulevard in Los Angeles. So this is something that takes place along an entire street in a city. And as you can see, it's very delicate. Each shoe is made out of a ceramic tile. In the center piece, we have Martin Luther King Jr. shoes, casted in bronze. And so these various materials sort of tell you what this is about. However, it's a way more intimate way to interact with something where you have to actually walk down a street and think about the impact of that person's involvement with the civil rights movement at the time, not just Martin Luther King Jr.'s. This is talking about not just important figures within the civil rights movement, but also every single person that contributed to the making 
the power of that movement in a really impressive way that also asks you to join in that march for civil rights. So that's really it. Those are sort of the four different projects that I wanted to show you that really talk about different types of materials and various ways for a viewer to interact with your monument. So to consider what this might look like and how people would interact with it is extremely important. So yeah, that is it. Thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, I will be available for further questioning during a Wednesday office hours.